Hello, and welcome to the penultimate session in our six part series on democracy. I am Teresa Lee, the litigation director of the Election Law Clinic here at Harvard Law School. The clinic is running this series along with co hosts, Professor Guy Uriel Charles, Professor Lawrence Lessig, and Professor Nicholas Stephanopoulos. We are thrilled for you all to be joining us. Today, we will discuss money in politics. Leading us today is someone who for years has been at the forefront on the question of the influence of money in our political system, Professor Lawrence Lessig, the Roy L. Furman Professor of Law and Leadership here at Harvard Law School. Professor Lessig, while a brilliant academic, perhaps stands apart in his consistent commitment to putting his ideas into action in the real world, including related to the hard questions of money and politics through ambitious litigation, actual campaigns, communications efforts, and grassroots mobilization. Professor Lessig will moderate the discussion today and will be happy to take your questions. If you have a question, please put it in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom interface and we will do our best to get to them. Just a reminder that this session is being recorded and will later be available on the HLS YouTube channel. Okay, Professor Lessig, over to you. Thank you, Teresa, and thank you to my co-panelists for joining today. Um, I'm going to introduce them briefly, and then I'm going to ask each of them to give us a couple minutes of their thoughts before we get into a conversation. Um, the first I'll introduce is Jane Mayer, who is well known, I'm sure, to everyone who's tuned in here. She's been at The New Yorker since 1995, and among her many portfolios is the Money in Politics portfolio, um, and her book Dark Money has made her um, one of the most influential thinkers about this problem, and um, it continues, of course, to be an issue and a problem that we'll be discussing uh, today. Second is Brad Smith, who um, has also been involved in this fight for as long as there's been a fight. He's been in it longer than I have been in this question of uh, money and politics. He was the chairman of the FEC from 2000 to 2005, and he's a professor of law at Capital University Law School. Um, where he teaches on many issues, but in, in, as well teaches in, in this area. And third is Jake Grumbach, who is a professor of political science at Washington University and writes about the political economy of many things, but especially we're going to talk about the aspect as it affects money in politics today. Um, so the question is money in politics, and it's both the problem and the reforms. Um, but let's start um, thinking a little bit more about the problem, Jane. Uh, why don't you give us your update about where we are with dark money, and maybe we've seen something quite recently that gives us a clear sense of that effect. Okay, sure. Um, listen, I'm glad to be with you all. Thanks so much for having me. Um, and I come to you just as a reporter who sort of um, keeps bumping into money as I cover politics. Um, and um, I, I think, you know, in updating since, since the book Dark, my book, Dark Money, came out, one of the things that people point out a lot is that in the 2020 election, um, the Democrats spent more dark money um, than the Republicans did. So there's sort of a tendency for people to say, you see, it's all equal is equalizing out and it's, you know, a bipartisan situation and, you know, and no, how, no foul, no harm, basically. And what I wanted to say was, I think it's very important for people to understand that if you step back and look at studies like the one that um, Martin Gillens did about elite money in politics, um, he's a professor at, at Princeton, um, what you can see is that, that elite money, big money from very wealthy donors is absolutely flooding the zone. And whether they're Democrats or they're Republicans, they have their own private interests. And, and studies have shown, as Gillens has shown, that, that, that they're quite different from what the public interest is in, in many ways, um, it, it, regardless of which party they're from. The public tends to be much more in favor of, of spending on, on social services and on redistributive tax proposals and is also more in favor of labor, um, the organized labor generally. And so um, so the, this, this equalizing out of the two parties, I would say, doesn't fix the problem for those who are thinking that it might. Um, 
And um, and um, one of the, the things that I wrote about not so very long ago was among the policies that the public favors that the big money doesn't, um, particularly the big money on the conservative side, is reform of the money system. Um, and there was uh, a, a just an absolutely blockbuster tape that surfaced that I got a chance to write about that had the private conversations of people from the, the Koch network talking with um, some of the leaders of the Republican Party on in the Senate about how to kill reform efforts on money in politics. And the tape um, was of a, a conference call that took place in January of, of 2021. Um, and what was so interesting was that these advocates who were trying to block reform on of the of the sort of money in politics um, were saying that the, to their horror, the public wildly supported reform. And they had done market testing to figure out what messages might convince the public to come along with them in blocking reform. And every message they tried failed. Um, and it was not this issue of reforming the money in politics was not just popular with liberals, not just with Democrats. It was overwhelmingly popular with conservatives too. The public wants reform. The private interests are blocking it, particularly on the conservative side. If you had democracy, there would be reform, but you don't because there's been a capture on this issue of the mechanisms of reform, particularly on Capitol Hill. Um, and what have I seen about the why this matters? Um, most recently, I just wrote a piece about the confirmation fight of Sarah Bloom Raskin, who was um, nominated to be by Biden to become the vice chairman of the Federal Reserve in charge of supervising all the banks in the country. Raskin had made some comments about how she thought that climate change was an issue that economic regulators needed to take into account. It's a, her position and her statements on this issue were completely consistent with what central bankers are saying in every other country. Climate change potentially poses a risk to the economic system internationally. We need to start thinking about this and thinking about whether something should be done you know, to, to sort of safeguard the system. That's what she said. Because she said those things, she was um, smeared and attacked pretty mercilessly, and I would argue very unfairly, by a dark money group. I went as a reporter to try to find out whose money was in this dark money group. It's called the American Accountability Foundation. Um, and um, you can't find out squat. I mean, what, because it was organized and recognized by the IRS in December of uh, 2020, there's no 990 form available to the, that it would be a public form that would let you see their financing. Um, you can't find out very much about whose money stopped America's central bank, the most important one in the world, from moving forward on taking climate change into account. Um, it's an incredibly important issue. You can't find whose private money was in there, but you can guess because you can see um, who the senators were who blocked it. And they've all taken tons of money from fossil fuels. It would be really nice to know I think the public deserves to know, but as a reporter, I can't hold them accountable because I can't follow the money because our system is so lacking in transparency. Brad, um, you actually um, I have a particular contribution to make about this question of transparency. You, we've lost your, your camera, Brad. I'm just seeing paper. Is there something? There we are. Yeah. Is that clear? My, yeah. my apologies. Yeah, so um, why don't you take it up from here? Sure. Um, I'm, I'm not going to get directly. I do want to talk about transparency and hopefully more in the questions, but I want to talk first about a few other points. And I thank you, Larry. Thanks, Jane. Thank you, Jake, for your time and, and you, you viewers for, for your time here. Um, at this point, I want to make rather three very general points. First, there are real issues about money and politics. I'm mean, public concern about this is not stupid or foolish or anything. But uh, I would suggest that there are, are three things that we need to keep in mind as we think about regulation. First is that uh, regulation is problematic as well. 
When you talk about the government regulating money in politics, there's simply no way around the fact that you're talking about the government regulating core political speech. Now, some people say, oh, it's, you know, we're regulating money, not speech. But imagine if we said, for example, that the New York Times can only spend $3,000 a year to report on a campaign. Everybody would recognize that that limited their reach, limited their ability to talk and speak and so on. So we are talking about uh, political speech. And I would suggest that it's just as, as uh, a law, for example, that prohibits people from spe- sleeping under bridges affects poor people much more than rich people. It's very easy to draft uh, facially neutral laws that you know are more likely to hit your political opponents than, than your own side. And since incumbents are drafting these laws, we have to be very careful about this. And in fact, this, I think, is precisely one of the things that the First Amendment was intended to guard against, was having the government uh, make these kinds of choices. The second thing I want to point out is that money is often a good thing in politics, and we, and we shouldn't forget that. Uh, a number of studies have shown that money, uh, higher spending increases uh, voter awareness of the candidates, voters' ability to link candidates to issues and ideologies. Uh, higher spending can be used to suppress turnout, but can also be used to promote turnout. And by and large, uh, we tend to get good turnout with high spending elections. Um, money can equalize candidates. There are times uh, when money may make candidates less equal, but it can make candidates more equal. Envision, for example, a candidate who has widespread support among the press, which is always exempt from these campaign finance laws. Um, in that case, uh, higher spending by the challenger may uh, equalize the race. And in fact, in many cases, even lower spending by the challenger will equalize the race because it assures that message gets out. And that's one of the big things it does. It assures that messages get out. So for example, prior to the 2020 election, we had a widespread media blackout and Twitter literally revoked the account or shut down temporarily the account of the New York Post for reporting on the Hunter Biden laptop story. In the last couple of weeks, it's become clear that everybody now admits the Hunter laptop story was true. So private spending that allowed that message to at least get out somewhat was better than leaving it over to a handful of editors at the nation's you know, largest newspapers and networks and, and a few executives at Twitter and, and Facebook, which largely buried it through algorithms. So money can have an equalizing role as well as uh, one that doesn't equalize. Finally, the key thing is that money is not really the problem in the way that people tend to think. Uh, Despite our intuitions, there's very little empirical evidence that suggests that money changes how people vote. Generally, donors give to candidates who already agree with them and tend to to think like them. Um, Contrary to what many people think, there's very little corporate money in politics. Corporate money from for-profit corporations typically makes up a small percentage and single digits of total political spending. The vast majority of spending in the United States comes from individuals. Third is this question of dark money. Dark money typically in every election cycle makes up somewhere between about one and a half and 4% of total political spending. And even there, much of it is very well known. For example, dark money groups include groups uh, like uh, uh, the National Association of Realtors, for example, as if people don't know, you know what they are and what their kind of interests are. So this is an issue that's vastly overblown and realize it's very hard to get at. For example, the example Jane uses is somebody who's not even trying to affect an election, right? They're not trying to affect an election. It's not campaign finance. Um, They're just spending money about a nominee. Well, if you can't spend money to voice your own views about nominees, what else can't you spend money on? Or what else do you have to have disclosed all the time? You know, almost every idea, as Holmes said, Every idea is an incitement for people to take some kind of action. So you risk having the government overwhelm the entire system of speech with regulation. So again, regulation uh, is problematic in its own own way. It can be detrimental to the system in many ways. We should not forget that. And ultimately, it's unlikely to solve the problems that people most care about. And for that reason, I think it's a very dangerous power to give to the government. And I think that's precisely why we have a First Amendment, is to keep government out of regulating political speech. So that would be, I think, the framework in which I tend to look at these issues. Thanks. That's great. Thank you. Um, Jake, why don't you take it from there? Absolutely. Uh, Thanks so much for having me on this great panel with some outstanding co-panelists and thanks Professor Lessig for moderating and uh, Adam Harper for behind the scenes sort of organizing. So I'm a a quantitative social scientist 
uh, who comes from a sort of different angle on this than the normative and legal questions of, for example, uh, speech and information, but rather studying over the long term, political scientists, economists, sociologists have studied money in politics as a form of political participation or influence. So in a democracy, people's main voice within the political system is the vote that's distributed equally, but money as a form of political participation is distributed very unequally. So over the long term, uh, so uh, in the pre-1970s period, uh, there was a tremendous amount of social science that was very concerned about the influence of corporate money and big money in politics. But then later uh, came a sort of uh, a, a new wave of uh, social science research that suggested that money in politics actually was either helpful or innocuous, where a uh, coal supporting legislator was getting money from coal companies um, that didn't really matter. They donated because they were already friendly to coal. But then this was actually, we're now in a new golden age of social science that's uncovering many more sort of subterranean mechanisms by which money in politics really does influence political outcomes. So. I think uh, it doesn't influence political outcomes in terms of straightforward quid pro quo vote buying in most cases. And that's how much of the early quantitative social science worked was saying, look, some LGBT rights member of Congress doesn't su suddenly get some, you know, conservative evangelical money and then say, you know, actually, I don't support gay rights or something like that. Instead, money in politics works with these modern statistical methods. We really find money in politics works in three or four major ways. One is that early money is a selectorate. It's a sort of pre-primary electorate that determines the field of viable candidates. Um, this is hugely important research from uh, people like Adam Bonica, Hans Hassel, myself, others shows that uh, when you can tap your elite law school classmates for some big early seed money, you are a viable candidate as opposed to uh, candidates from more working class backgrounds, uh, uh, candidates of color, women candidates who are uh, disadvantaged at these early stages of fundraising. Second, it influences access and the ability to lobby. So actually about 85% of lobbying money, which uh, in sometimes is greater than the overall amounts of hard money spending, uh, uh, comes from corporate uh, uh, lobbying outfits. And uh, money in politics serves as sort of bringing wine to a party uh, in this subtle way. It buys access. A great field experiment by Josh Kala and David Brockman shows if you randomly assign uh, people to hit up their member of Congress as donors versus just ordinary constituents, the donors get more meetings. Um, that is uh, extremely important to signal uh, to legislators and to incumbents uh, what people's priorities are, um, influence the fine print of policy, and so forth. Um, there's uh, in addition, money, uh, as Jane Mayer and uh, Marianne Bertrand, the economist, and many others have shown, in the post-Citizens United era especially, but also in general, money in politics builds organizational infrastructure, um, mass uh, groups of interest groups, lobbying firms, and so forth, and can even subsidize sort of grassroots or astroturf uh, sort of mass-based lobbying on issues. In the Citizens United era as well, we have causal quantitative studies that really show, especially at the state legislative level, uh, uh, you know, which constitutionally controls uh, you know, election law, districting, and so many other democratic institutions, we have quantitative evidence that Citizens United, by rolling back state restrictions on, uh, on contributions, has uh, really elected more Republicans and more of the Republicans that uh, in the state legislative level that are concerning for issues of stop the steal style uh, uh, sort of democracy opposition in the 2020 presidential election. Um, so overall, money in politics works in these multifaceted ways, and in particular, corporate or extremely wealthy individuals have these multiple tools at their disposals, whereas ordinary individuals who are donating to a favorite candidate, uh, you know, donating their handful of hundred dollars, don't have this multifaceted uh, 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 way of using a holistic strategy of money in politics that includes access, lobbying, selectorate, uh, uh, sort of weaning out the candidates they don't like at, like at early stages and so forth. So uh, we're in a golden age of social science where quantitative work, I think, is really uncovering these mechanisms. So Jake, that's great um, to bring up uh, kind of the next generation inquiry uh, from the social science perspective. Um, I want to push the next generation like remedy question. Um, Brad, when you were at the FEC, of course, the big fight was about 
tech, uh, legislation that was suppressing access to money in politics. The uh, uh, McCain-Feingold Bipartisan Campaign Finance Reform Act had all sorts of soft money suppression and all sorts of places where people couldn't speak. But I wonder whether um, the same kind of concerns with, as you put it, quote unquote, regulation exist when we start thinking about just different ways of funding elections. So we've seen a lot of movement in the context of, for example, vouchers as a method for funding elections. That's not necessarily suppressing anybody's speech, it's just spreading the opportunity of people to participate more broadly. Um, and, and I wonder whether you think there is a legitimate problem there to be addressed, because you were one of the most prominent people when Citizens United came out that said, look, contrary to the chicken littles like Lessig, um, we're not going to see tons of corporate money uh, out there. And you were right. But then speech now came down and super PACs became uh, a device. And in the last election, um, uh, super PACs spent five times the amount of money that political parties spent. And even though you're right, outside spending is just 30% of total spending. What's significant about super PACs is the concentration. So the top 10 super PACs spent 54% of the super PAC money of the outside spending money that there was to be spent. So there's a huge amount of influence in a small number of people. And I wonder whether when you look at remedies that are just trying to spread the influence of money out, whether you have the same ideological resistance to that, or whether there might be a way for a conservative to embrace the idea that we ought to spread power as, as opposed to concentrate power. Well, you know, as you kind of point out, Larry, there are a whole number of ways, like, like some people talk about, should we have publicly funded campaigns? Well, that can mean anything. That's like saying, you know, should we regulate the marketplace? Well, you know, that, that can mean little regulation, lots of regulation, one kind, another kind. So there's a, numerous permutations. And but but to give a sort of a broad general answer as to why I'm skeptical about almost all of these permutations, it is the idea that, again, it, it's pretty easy for government to get in and start saying, here's who we want to win. Here's who we want to control things. For example, already, uh, why do we have this stupid thing on every ad for 20 years? Some people can no longer remember when we didn't have it, where the candidate says, I'm so-and-so and I approve this message. That's because the government went in there and said, you have to put this in your ad or you get penalized on getting your ad rates for TV. And at the time, it was very clear in Congress that members of Congress thought that this would, having people say this, would prevent people from attacking them so much in their ads. Now, I think they were largely wrong about that, but that was clearly one of the things they intended to do. And so you can see that kind of thing where, where you know, once the government is funding the campaigns, it starts to put its tentacles in. And you can envision the pressures that would come. Well, you shouldn't allow people to spend their money on disinformation, like say the Hunter Biden laptop, which turns out to be true. You know, you shouldn't let people to spend their money on promoting a lab leak theory, which is disinformation, except it turns out to be probably true. So I, I'm very skeptical of these efforts to, to kind of perfect it in this way. I also think that I, I just end real quick by noting that I think both Jake and Jane and their comments really focus heavily more on the issue of, of lobbying influence, Jane in the terms of grassroots lobbying, Jake in terms of both grassroots and, and sort of direct person-to-person uh, -person lobbying. And to me, that's an even more complex issue than, than the campaign finance uh, matter. But it is worth noting that, that large corporations spend about 10 times as much money lobbying as all their political contributions of all types combined. So that, that's a problem too. Jake, do you want to, do you want to add something about these yeah. alternative remedies? Yeah, no, absolutely. So I, I think Brad actually makes a really important point about the difficulty of regulating money in politics, where uh, we've seen actually through generations of concern about, uh, you know, sort of undue influence in a democracy or unequal influence that money in politics regulation often is like you put a stick, I don't know the cliche metaphor, you put a stick in a stream, and it just goes around. The money goes elsewhere and finds a way to influence politics. That's uh, and uh, especially, you know, especially wealthy individuals and corporations have brilliant lawyers to uh, circumvent regulation in this way, as intrepid investigative journalists like Jane Mayer, you know, have uncovered. Um, so I think this is difficult. At the same time, public financing does seem, Professor Lessig, as you kind of began to suggest, as an effective way to sort of equalize voice. Um, through this process, rather than uh, uh, sort of finding nifty ways to Rube Goldberg machine regulate uh, uh, spending, 
and uh, contributions rather to uh, essentially give everybody an equal voice through something like Seattle's democracy voucher program where everybody gets a, you know, uh, $50 or $100 credit that they can uh, donate or other public financing systems where candidates commit to not taking other forms of money. So that's a way to essentially make uh, uh, political voice through money more equal rather than uh, construct uh, really difficult damning procedures for the torrent of money there. So to avoid, so the lawyers on the call will recognize this reference, to avoid this talk appearing in a Supreme Court opinion with Justice Roberts citing it, um, I want to emphasize that there are two reasons why one might want something like vouchers. One might be that you're committed to equalizing voice. And I want to say, I'm not trying to equalize voice. The other thing you might be committed to is just reducing improper or corrupting dependence on a very small number of people. And that's the point I'm making about super PAC spending. Like one of the reasons why super PAC spending can be so influential is you know if you get on the wrong side, you'll just be taken out. I mean, look at the Republican Party as it relates to climate change. Before 2010, the Republican Party talked about climate change. John McCain thought he had a better climate change package than Barack Obama. But in 2010, the Koch brothers made it clear to the world that if you talked about climate change as a Republican, you were gonna be taken out, you were gonna be primaried. And all of a sudden, this single influence had a radical change on the debate. Um, not because there wasn't pro-climate change speech out there, it's just the concentrated strategic influence, which I think is a different concern from equalizing. And certainly it's a different concern from all the very legitimate concerns Brad is raising about suppressing speech and making the government the selector here. Um, but Jane, I wanna bring back this question that Brad teed up about like, why should we really care to know who actually killed Raskin's nomination? Well, yeah, and 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 what he was saying, um, Brad, what you're saying is that that you know why shouldn't um, people be able to speak on the subject of a nomination, and and uh, you know I, I I mean I'm not an advocate, but just as a citizen, I think people should of course be able to speak on nominations and on all kinds of other issues, but what I found as a reporter. Um, that, that is frustrating and I think um, inhibits democracy is that they're speaking anonymously. And I know you feel that this is some, uh, that there's a right to speak anonymously through your money. But I can tell you, practically speaking, as a reporter, what it means is the public can't follow the corruption. And there is such a thing, unless you don't believe there's such a thing as corruption, um, there is such a thing, and I bump into it every other day in covering politics, where private interests are capturing policy, capturing, trying to, to, to attack people, maybe smear people, and you can't know exactly who it is that's speaking. And, and, and I, I, it, you know, it seems that the, the, the sort of the pro-spending movement seems to be more and more on the precipice of also endorsing the idea that there ought to be an absolute right to speak anonymously by spending money anonymously. We've seen in that in the Americans for Prosperity case that took that, that was in front of the Supreme Court this last year. And I guess what I'd like to know from Brad is, do you think there should be any limits on on um, you know on private on um, requiring public dis disclosure of of spending on 501c3s, 501c4s? Um, on any kind of um, spending. Sure. Uh, well, at the Institute for Free Speech, which I chair, um, we have always supported the disclosure of direct contributions to candidates and funds which are used directly for uh, promoting the election or defeat of candidates. And, and that's the traditional area of disclosure. Be aware that all of these proposals to get more disclosure are new. They are, they are the aggressors, so to speak, that want to change the regime that has governed our history. Uh, and there are vital reasons for people to want to be able to speak anonymously. You know, it's, it's an old saw, but, but it's true. I mean, the, the core case is a case called NAACP versus Alabama, for those not familiar with it, in which the state of Alabama in the 1950s used the pretext of uh, an investigation into corporate behavior to demand list of donors to the NAACP. 
And this, the NAACP refused, and the Supreme Court noted that this would be very damaging to the organization, people's willingness to support the organization. Now, the NAACP in the, in, in the late 50s is a, is a unique situation, but it's not, uh, you, you know, uh, it's not like this is not heard of elsewhere with people supporting controversial causes, whether they be pro-abortion or pro-life, or, you know, whether they be uh, pro-transgender or viewed as anti-transgender, all kinds of things that are very controversial causes. And there's a lot of evidence that people do in fact stop speaking. And the first amendment is not only to protect those who are bold and brave and wanna stand behind their opinions, it's to protect those who are meek and shy and don't want Twitter mobs and don't want people protesting outside their house and don't wanna be hassled and harassed. It's to protect people who are worried about their employees. If I speak out as an individual, but I'm president of a company and a bunch of people then go to boycott my company, my employees are gonna be the losers more than I am. I wanna keep my support quiet. So there's lots of reasons for people to do this. And I think we get carried away. For example, the American uh, Accountability Foundation that Jane mentioned. So I'd never heard of them before. I mean, I've probably seen their name, but I don't pay attention to the to names. So I looked them up while we've been talking and I discovered it was founded by two guys, a guy named Tom James, who was an aide to Republican Senator Ron Johnson and former Republican Senator Jim DeMint and a research director for the Cruise for President campaign. And the other guy's a guy named Matthew uh, Bueller, who was an assistant to President Trump. And at that point, I feel like I've got a pretty good sense of what this group is about. And I, I may not know exactly who's providing the funds, but I think as a voter, as a citizen, as a reporter, we can figure out what's going on here. So I, I think sometimes we get carried away in, in thinking that, you know, just because we don't know every detail about somebody that we're left totally in the dark and are unable to make decisions. And we need to recognize that there are benefits to anonymity. How you draw the line is going to be a tough battle. I think the Supreme Court got it pretty much right in a decision last summer, Americans for Prosperity Foundation versus Bonta. And we won't go into the details because we need to talk. <laughs> So. Well, I mean, I, I'll just answer quickly, you know, that, that to know the names of two individuals who work at an organization, you can be pretty certain that a couple of former um, congressional aides are not paying for it. Um, they, 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 they are salary people, but they are, it's not their money that is, it, that is paying for whatever this campaign and the research is. So it doesn't really, you know, and you, you, you know, and the other thing is you can't as a reporter just sort of say, oh, well, they did this, so they must do that. You don't, you can't really just, you know, free associate what you think might be true. You actually have to uh, get the facts and, and, and pin them down. Um, and I and I think the reason, of course, and one other thing to say about this is the reason, of course, that this issue that that you say is the aggressor, the idea of disclosing money that's going into nonprofit organizations, um, is uh, has become more aggressive, is because Citizens United freed up those organizations to become much more involved in politics, and so because of that, you see them everywhere if you cover politics, and but you still don't know whose money it is. So it's just become an, the money is just moved to another another kind of organization and 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 we you know we all sort of recognize that um but but again um you know and i it seems to me that the forefront the frontier seems to be arguing at this point that they should have less disclosure if anything um and you know leave scalia behind for saying this is the land of the brave and and everybody ought to be able to stand up and say who they are when they want to get involved in american politics see there's one, a very one interesting sense, connection. Like, can, I, can i do yeah. one sentence which is just to ask jane this question whose mind would be changed by knowing who was funding those ads as opposed to simply who found it not just were employees but found it the group but you see, Brad, it's not an agenda of changing people's minds. It's an agenda of supporting democracy. The idea is not to try to change somebody's mind. It's in order to inform the public. They need to know, just like you may want to know, like when you see an ad on TV um, or, you know, pushing, um, I don't know, you know, reverse mortgages or something, you may want to know a little bit more about them, like who's getting rich off of it. Um, is it really a good consumer product or is it not? This isn't necessarily to help a Democrat or a Republican, it's to help the Republic. Well, I want to, I want to build on this with something Jake said, um, uh, because, you know, again, the old school vision of corruption, the vision that the Supreme Court has embraced, quid pro quo corruption, um, creates exactly the tension between Jane and Brad, because Brad says, yes, of course, we should be disclosing contributions to candidates because there's where, quote unquote, corruption can happen. 
But as Justice Kennedy said in Citizens United, by definition, if it's independent spending, it can't be quote unquote corruption. But Jake, your point was, we're learning all the other ways in which influence might be manifested. And if there are non quid pro quo corruption ways in which the system might be corrupted, could there be a reason for the information that Jane is trying to get to be in the marketplace, even if it's not demonstrating that somebody has engaged in a crime? Yes, this is a critical, critical point. And one thing I would say just is that uh, uh, one reason that uh, disclosure is opposed by large donors uh, in the Citizens United era and in other times is because of consume, potential consumer backlash, which is sort of a, a, a medium diffuse balance between the, the equal democracy of the vote, everybody gets one vote, consumers, it's sort of weighted by your ability to consume, but it is a more diffuse group and individuals who donate large sums of money and are affiliated with a particular corporation or industry or something like that can face uh, backlash from consumers. But in general, uh, one important thing compared to the NAACP case in the 1950s is a context really has changed in a number of ways. One big one is we're in a new gilded age of wealth inequality. So uh, voice through money speech is more unequal now. And the ability to speak in terms of monetary spending is much more unequal. And it's created a really large scale empires of, I guess, what we'd call political speech through money, through the creation of interest groups, the financing of entire sort of quasi grassroots movements, the purchasing of media firms now by individual wealthy people, um, even just basic charitable giving. Now we see how this has really influenced the political agenda. If large foundations really control, you know, the education reform discussion or whatnot, this takes sort of uh, the potential democratically produced solutions that an ordinary democratic republic would produce through citizen voice um, and really uh, drives them through money as the principal form of determining which direction this goes. So this is a new challenge, the same way, you know, I wouldn't say John Roberts saying uh, racism is different than in 1965 VRA times as context has changed. I wouldn't go that far, but I would say in terms of wealth inequality and the ability to use new technologies to spend, create entire sort of empires of organized, organized groups um, through interest group networks, that is new. And then a last, last point is that I think is really underemphasized in this current sort of crisis of American democracy, which is coming out of the state level, which regulates constitutionally elections, counts votes, um, determines electoral college votes, um, uh, does districting, uh, uh, and so many other things. Uh, money in politics matters more at these lower levels where individual voters have less information less ability to monitor what state legislators are doing and state legislative primaries. Money is really, really influential at these lower levels and fundamentally has been rupturing the sort of relationship between state level governments and constituents over this uh, past decade or so. I mean, I think that's really true. I was out in Arizona doing a piece for the New Yorker um, and looking at sort of the where the sort of the support for the the um, the kind of what people have been calling Trump's big lie, his claim that you know that 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 he actually won in 2020 came from, and I think you see a a, a lot of um, um, sort of the 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 more sort of radical ideas bubbling up from state legislatures on the right, where they're they're as you say, I think it's 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 you probably demonstrably true that money goes a lot further in these these small local elections basically and that's where you're beginning to see things like the sort of the independent legislative doctrine popping up and in Arizona there was somebody who literally who pushed legislation that would have allowed them to the legislature to override the popular vote in choosing the electoral college um, votes from the state of Arizona and and um I think you can see that the that private interests have more even more sway in 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 the states and we're beginning to see you know to, what were laboratories for democracy are becoming laboratories for autocracy. So I, I wonder whether we can get some agreement though about what might be at stake. I wonder like I want to push a kind of non-binary position here about this transparency question. Um, so Jane, could you concede that you know, at the kind of $100 level, the fact that somebody sends 
$100 in to support some LGBTQ group or some you know, pro right wing group. Um, it's not as essential to democracy that we'd be able to call that person out as it is to be able to call that person out if they've given $100 million to support one cause or another or support the defeat of a uh, FEC commissioner. Well, sure. Um, I mean, there ought to be some kind of, you know, a, 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 a threshold, I, I am sure. But I did recently um, call up the, you know, the ACLU has been on the side of, um, for instance, Americans for Prosperity in the, in the Bonta case and um, ask them, what is an example of, of people since the ACLU case, I mean, excuse me, since the NAACP case, of, of, of donors having been harassed. Um, is there a modern example of that? And, and they, they couldn't come up with one. Um, it's not something, I mean, it's a potential threat. I understand, I can imagine it. Um, it's not beyond the imagining today with Twitter mobs and people showing up surrounding people's houses and things like that, but it doesn't actually exist. And it, it is being used to sort of guide us on something that's as important as corrupting democracy when it's just a theoretical threat. Um, and 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 so you know, I would I, I'd like to see some evidence that that this is an actual threat to people, and that it's it's a threat so serious that it out outweighs the idea of of public um, transparency on who's right. behind. And so then on the on the other side, Brad, um, you know, it, it, the equivalent of what happened with the Koch brothers in 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 two thousand and ten. You know, an organization says. Anybody who takes a position that credits climate change, we will primary. Is it, is it a really, do you think it's really critical that we not be able to know at least who is behind the money that's pushing, uh, you know, $100 million, $200 million, they came close to spending a billion dollars in the last uh, two cycles ago. Is it, is it really a critical constitutional right that we not be able to know who those people are? Well, let's back up a second. First, I would agree with the the, the premise that you gave when you asked a version of the question to Jane, which is, you know, yeah, we should, I think we ought to be able to agree we don't need all these small donors. And so many state laws begin at like $1, $10, $50, $100. And I really think those numbers should be bumped up substantially. And I would hope that would be an area that everybody could agree on. Then you, you're, you're quite right. When you have big donors, I mean, in a sense, the big donors may need more protection. They may have more to lose. Again, if they're if they've got to worry about 300 employees in their business, or if they've got to worry, uh, you know, uh, about sort of, uh, the, you know, being targeted by the government, uh, more likely being denied government contracts and so on. At the same time, they're obviously more influential, and there might be more need for the public to know. So there's going to have to be some some balancing there. Um, but there are lots of uh, I, I do say there are, are just. There are so many examples of people being retaliated against. There was a woman who worked for the El Coyote restaurant in Los Angeles. She gave $100 to a ballot proposition and people protested outside the, the restaurant until she finally was forced to leave town. So the restaurant wouldn't go bankrupt and the employees wouldn't lose their money. She was the daughter of the uh, owner of the uh, restaurant, by the way. I mean, there were people who lost their jobs. I can't remember the names. I didn't think this would even come up. This was so apparent. A uh, fellow who was the director of the, I think it was the Sacramento Performance arts company. Uh, uh, Brendan Eich at Mozilla is a famous example. I mean, th there are just, uh, uh, there's, you know, little restaurants in, in Indiana who get beaten up by this stuff. There are lots and lots of these examples. They're all over the place if you want to look. The question is, do you think that 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 the benefits are worth it is is a, you know a valid question. But to suggest that there's no cost, it's just a theoretical cost, I just think is not a tenable position. Okay, but again, let's think about the Koch brothers example. When the Koch brothers are pushing the idea that there should be no climate change legislation, if I know that it's the Koch brothers and I know Koch industries, I have a pretty clear sense of like what might be motivating that. Um, not a good, not a clear sense of what's in the public interest necessarily, but what might actually be in the private interest. So isn't the political debate enhanced by having that kind of information in the marketplace of ideas? Um, and, and what would the privacy interest be that would be so substantial to say, if you're going to put a billion dollars into the political system, you should be allowed to do it anonymously? 
Well, you know, again, that's certainly a tougher question. Bear in mind, though, a lot of times efforts to change society have to come from people who are willing to finance the publication of ideas. Some people will be bold enough to put their names out there and be out front, but you need other people to do the financing. You know, it's interesting. We all know who the Koch brothers are. We all know what they've paid for. And this is what I say. Sometimes we get carried away. You know, the opposite is uh, of worrying about people being silenced is we get carried away with thinking, we have no idea what's going on. And, and actually we do have a pretty good idea who's funding these things and what they're doing. And in the end, I think what we really need to know is, is to sit and think, are we capable of judging arguments? Are we capable of deciding whether we think climate change is a threat? And if so, how great a threat? And if so, what response we ought to have to it? And I would like to see us go back to focusing more on the merits. So you've asked a tough question, Larry, and you're smart enough to know that I'm kind of dodging it, right? Um, you know, the Coke's a billion dollars. That's the really tough question. And and they're, at, when you get to these higher levels, the argument for disclosure gets much, much uh, I think more powerful, but I don't think we should overlook the fact that there remain powerful arguments that our democracy benefits from people being allowed to support unpopular ideas without risking their fates, their fortunes, their lives. Always remember like in To Kill a Mockingbird, right? The bad guys didn't go after Gregory Peck because he was a tough dude. They went after his kids, you know, and you need to remember these kinds of things are, again, get very complex. So the question really is, you say, is there a constitutional right to keep it quiet, I would say, is there some right you have to know just because you want to know? I don't know that people have a right to know lots of things about me. And even if I were much richer, I don't know that people would have a right to know lots of things about me and about my political beliefs and who I associate with and, and, and so on. So it's a lot of difficult issues. Okay. Just, say, just yeah, for context. Please. Yeah, for context, though, like I would say, so one is that in many of these cases, like people do many public social media posts about these particular issues, which generates outrage and then people do look up campaign finance records as well so it's not this quite the NAACP story but then in addition uh, we can everybody's vote whether they turned out to vote and their voter registration status is public information right that is it can be embarrassing to find out somebody didn't vote these uh, there's a number of other things that are generally public uh, that uh, have long been norms um, and also I would say Abby Wood uh, law professor at USC, research on transparency, both that transparency does affect legislative behavior when there's an audit of somebody's camp and candidate or incumbent's campaign finance records. And also tra transparency is just, again, ridiculously popular in the mass public, as are many of these uh, sort of, uh, you know, equalizing influence and anti-corporate interest based uh, uh, campaign finance reform. So that in a democracy too, is just a tough, this, what do you call it, circle to square when you get really super, you can't get much agreement in today's American politics, but you can about transparency. Okay, so we've got a bunch <laughs> of great questions. I was just going to say, Chip. Brad, I love how you say that, the, the, like, we all know who the Cokes are and the, how much money they put in. It took five years to write Dark Money. <laughs> it, it wasn't that easy. I mean, you know, it, it actually, it took, it takes a lot, a lot of work. And my guess is I probably scratched the surface. You know, you don't know what you don't know, um, but you can sort of guess that there's much more. So it's really, it's not like it's all there right at our fingertips the way you, 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 you might want it to be if you were me. I would be happy if you could just look it up really fast. It's not that easy. So. so we've got a lot of great questions from the audience. I just want to, so a couple of them are really good to clarify. Um, I, and, um, and Brad, actually this, given that you are the enforcer, this would be really uh, something you could make clear very easily. The question is, how do we think about quote, corporate donations? Does it include how top executives, officials, and board members of corporations make their personal donations? It depends on who's doing the, who's doing the calculating. Uh, re remember at the federal level and in a majority of states, corporations as corporations actually cannot make contributions to campaigns. Uh, so when you hear people say that, you know, Senator so-and-so referring to a US Senator received X corporations from your X dollars from some corporation. That's not really right. Exactly what people are talking about is they got money from people who worked for the corporation, executives of the corporation, maybe from the corporate PAC. And remember the corporate PAC is funded by voluntary contributions from people who work for the corporation. So I think that's generally what we're talking about. Now you see more direct corporate contributions for things as you've mentioned, Larry, like super PACs and so on. But even there, 
for-profit corporations have been pretty reluctant to get involved. Uh, and I think you you hit on it earlier. One of the things that super PACs did uh, was uh, was individual donors began uh, contributing much larger amounts. Fortunately, contributions to super PACs are disclosed. So, so that money, if, if, if disclosure is the issue, is, is there. I, I think that, that, I mean, I agree with you that, that, that we did not see the flood of corporate donations that people um, predicted would happen. What we saw was a flood of non, you know, not-for-profit corporations that, that at least I didn't anticipate to be as big as they were. Um, and, and that's, but that, that they have become huge players in American politics now, right? Yes, that's for sure. Um, um, okay, here's another great question. I'm not sure I'm gonna, I know exactly who to tag this with, but feel free to jump in. It feels like we've been operating in a world, I'm reading the question, where politics is saturated in money, where large fundraisers in New York raise millions of dollars in a single night. What do you make of states or electoral markets where there isn't much money thrown around? Oregon is one of the few states that does not limit campaign finance contributions for state elections. Is the absence of donors interested in Oregon in the absence of donors interested in Oregon politics, public sectors unions write the largest checks and have the most influence on state politics? Is that better or worse? Yeah, it's a great question. So uh, there's some really important work by uh, folks like Sarah Anzia on, for example, the role of what could can be considered relatively concentrated interests in state and local politics across the country, Oregon as well, but uh, uh, municipal state employees and teachers unions do have influence in these state level elections. Um, at the same time, there are a number of uh, reasons that this is different than uh, uh, heavily, highly concentrated, extremely narrow interests. So uh, we know teachers or nurses unions and things like that, they do have secondary effects when teachers influence elections more, there are potentially downstream effects uh, in terms of, you know, improving schools and, you know, work conditions within schools, which has, uh, you know, spillover effects and things like that. So there are uh, differences there also representing, you know, workers as a constituency may be different than um, executives in a, a heavily unequal, economically unequal society and things like that. But that is, again, the case where at lower levels, uh, money really does talk and information is uh, much lower. This is also true in ballot initiatives, um, which are seen as, you know, in states as this great democratic tool in some cases, but information is so low. So recent, you know, uh, kidney dialysis regulation uh, in California or, you know, things around the gig economy and employer classification, uh, these things are super obscure, uh, ads flood the zone, and it really is the case where it is hard to have individuals with declining state and local journalism that followed state and local politics. It's really hard for voters to know uh, how to vote when it doesn't map on to national partisan conflict, which everyone knows about. So I would say um, there is some great work on public sector unions, on pensions and things like that. I would say it's not a top level concern of unequal democracy, but uh, um, worth looking at and worth thinking about ways that at lower levels, democracy is especially hard to run. Yeah, and, and at the national level, it's important to, to keep that in context, right? So in 2020, um, less than, or, or exactly 0.53%, uh, uh, percent, so about one half of 1% of outside spending was union spending. Um, now unions and uh, contributions to super PACs and carry organizations about 174 million, which was about one sixth of nonprofit contributions, um, but less than, but more than for-profit contributions for the reasons Brad is talking about. I mean, the for-profit corporations are uh, anxious about the consequence. I, I wanna make sure that we, we keep, keep clear though about one feature that I don't think we've discussed enough about the alternatives. And I know Jake, you've been studying the effect of small dollar, small dollar contributions and, and um, vouchers in particular. One striking bit of evidence that comes out of Seattle is that of all the effects that vouchers have, the, the one that nobody was expecting, but which is most dramatic, is the effect on turnout. If you have a voucher and you spend your voucher, you're much more likely to turn out to vote. 90% of people 
who use their voucher turnout to vote versus like, you know, I think the data is something like 40 or 50% of people who don't use their voucher would turn out to vote. Um, so this, this becomes a way of, of evincing that if you bring more people into the funding market and diversify the funding market, you actually can increase the political participation market. Do you see that dynamic more generally? That's definitely the case. So this is gonna uh, remain to be seen whether the individual spending their vouchers would have turned out to vote anyways, but it is true that we are seeing in these places that have uh, implemented new campaign finance reforms uh, that empower small donors in this way. You do see a bit more in political engagement from ordinary people and the donor base became slightly more economically and age diverse. Um, it uh, there's remains growth to be made in terms of the racial diversification of money and politics in Seattle after this program, but that's really crucial. My research with Alexander Son and separately with Abby Wood and Abay and Asia at Berkeley Law shows that money and politics is overwhelming. It's disproportionately white, even uh, more so than you know Congress itself is, uh, where we struggle to get women and people of color represented. Um, this is a really big issue that. Uh, uh, democracy voucher reforms can potentially uh, uh, ameliorate, make a more representative uh, donor pool throughout the country. See, a couple of questions about judicial elections. Um, you know, are there, so one question is, are there studies on the role of um, money in the judicial elections and studies about the measure of the effect? And should we treat money in judicial elections in the same way? I wonder, Jane, whether you 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 have a sense of the dark money in the context of judicial elections that um, has been significant? I mean, I've read studies saying that um, money flowing into state Supreme Court elections is um, is is increasing um, dramatically, um, and um, obviously we've seen money on both sides being spent, dark money being spent on judicial nominations to the Supreme Court. Um, there's, you know, demand justice on the left and uh, the judicial crisis network, which became the judicial education or, or whatever the, the judicial confirmation network on, on the right, the sort of the Leonard Leo group. Um, I mean, I think a couple of things I wanted to say that I, I think that whenever you see big money, outside money, it tends, and this is not just on judicial elections, but it, it, it tends to, to focus, to nationalize elections um, it, because big donors are interested in, they're, they're often not in the state, they're interested in national policies. And, and, and so it, 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 it changes the dynamic in local politics often, taking it away from a focus on, on local things. I, I would also argue that a lot of big money tends to be polarizing because the kinds of people who want to give a million dollars to politics or whatever um, are people who care passionately about issues. And 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 they they you know they 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 don't tend to be wishy washy centrists, um, and so you you see um, I think I think that it, it probably increases polarization and nationalization of politics, and I imagine that may be true in the in the in at every level state judicial elections everything else going you know right on up to the Supreme Court, um, so. And that cat can't be put back in the bag. Like there's no more devolving authority to local levels to ameliorate polarization and things because the local level through money has been entirely integrated into national conflict in this way. Okay, Brad, do you wanna give a last word too? Because we've got one minute left before we're gonna sign off here. <laughs> well, I would just go back. First, I wanna address one question that's come up is what's the source for saying dark money is about 2% of total spending. You can find this at the Institute for Free Speech where we use numbers gathered by the Center for Responsive Politics and Open Secrets uh, to compute this. Uh, again, my position ultimately comes down to the fact that we're, we're talking some very, very complex issues here. I do think to the extent Jake has talked more about lobbying, I think that's really where money exercises perhaps a greater influence where the public can't really see what's going on. That's not really trying to persuade people the public how to vote. Uh, but that may be an even tougher nut to crack. So my, my ultimate message is there are important First Amendment values at stake. There's a reason why we have a First Amendment that, that covers this. Uh, and we need to be very careful where we tread. It's that simple. Jane, do you have anything else you'd like to add? Um, 
No, I mean, you know, I feel less scientific than, you know, I'm not a lawyer or a political scientist. I'm just a reporter. But I can just say that when I came to Washington with the Wall Street Journal um, to cover Reagan's White House, um, the, the influence of money was nothing compared with what it feels like today as a reporter covering politics. It's overwhelming. And I, I you know, I, I, I just... I, so I don't have all the answers to how to handle that, I think, but I can tell you, I, you can feel the change and you can see, see it in the policy capture and among other things on this issue of climate change and, and the environment, which used to be bipartisan. Jake, you have minus 30 seconds. Thanks everybody for a great panel. Uh, Jane, you would make an outstanding political scientist. Um. <laughs> or lawyer, we'll take you too, Jane. <laughs> I got it. Okay. <laughs> thank you though. Bradley, Jane, Jake, thank you so much. And thank you to everybody uh, for helping to attend and to organize. And um, I look forward to the sixth events uh, in this series, which will be happening next month. So thank you again. Thank Bye. you thank all. You, Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.